Louisiana, a land rich in history and resources, originally the home of the Natchez, the Homa, and the Choctaw, but the adopted home of Iberville, Bienville, and Tonti. Louisiana, the focus of international struggle and intrigue for centuries, a place of mystique, the home of a people known for distinct culture and institutions, the parish, the police jury. Louisiana, that catalyst of transforming the former British North American colonists into a national melting pot. Louisiana, the birthplace of jazz, the refinement of blues and the gospel, the source of Creole and Cajun food, the home of Huey Long and Evangeline, Lee Armstrong and Marie Laveau. The Louisiana Purchase, arguably the world's most significant real estate transaction, will be the subject of this semester-long series, both on its immediate importance but its continuing impact today. Hi there again. Here we are in week nine of our continuing series on the Louisiana Purchase. This week's lecture will be given by Dr. Arnold Hirsch, a native Chicagoan who has been a member of the UNL History Department since 1979. Hirsch, past department chair, is presently research professor and holder of the Ethel and Herman Mitlow Endowed Chair for New Orleans Studies. Dr. Hirsch has received both research and teaching awards. He is co-editor, along with the late Joseph Logson, of Creole New Orleans, Race and Americanization. In his lecture, Hirsch discusses newly acquired New Orleans as a foreign city occupied by Americans, who were in so many ways the antithesis of Creole New Orleans. How did the Creoles view these newcomers? And how did Americans view this utterly strange place? One way to measure the distance separating the natives from the newcomers involves perception and values regarding race. The tripartite racial order that emerged from the French and Spanish era of colonial control contrasted sharply with the Americans' desire for a dual chromatic regime that simply divided the populace into black and white. But that process was contested, conflicted, and never quite completed here. This was, in fact, what made New Orleans so different. It has become a cliche to call New Orleans unique, or the most un-American of American cities. People nod knowingly at references to its French and Spanish heritage, its unusual experience as a multiracial society, its experimentation with cultural forms found nowhere else in the United States. All of this simply begs the question, however, of how the newly acquired Louisiana territory was perceived by its most recent occupiers when, in fact, they took possession of the city. It must be remembered, after all, that New Orleans was unique because it persisted. There were other French cities established in North America that were similarly incorporated into the United States, but none represented the same problem as that posed by the absorption of New Orleans. Detroit, Chicago, and St. Louis were all part of the same great French arch that ran from the Great Lakes down the Mississippi Valley to New Orleans, its anchor at the mouth of the Great River. The French imprint was as unmistakable in these settlements as it had been in the Crescent City. Detroit was founded, in fact, 17 years before New Orleans by the French-Canadian Antoine de Lamothe Cadillac, who later served as governor of colonial Louisiana and the first acknowledged non-native permanent inhabitant of Chicago was a Haitian of color, Jean-Baptiste Pointe du Sable, or as the local Indians put it, the first white man to settle in Chicago was a black man. He was simply unmistakably French, but the first of many such trappers to establish residence there. But in these towns, as in St. Louis, the French presence proved transient assimilated into native populations, defeated in war by the British and the Americans, finally driven westward by an aggressively expansionist Yankee presence, what remained of the French mantle rested lightly upon these towns until it was finally overwhelmed by an unrelenting wave of new migrants. Only traces of New France remained, except in New Orleans, which was different. New Orleans was nearly a century old by the time the Americans arrived to impose their brand of constitutional government on the city. It was, moreover, in the early stages of what, what would prove to be a sustained economic boom. Its population was growing at an accelerated rate. It had an already established, if not yet quite congealed, social order. 
and a majority of its residents neither spoke English nor had much experience in self-government. The largest city to be swept up in the United States headlong rush westward, New Orleans was no tabula rasa. It did not present a clean slate that offered a virtual fresh start in Detroit, Chicago, or St. Louis. If a little rich for American taste, it did nonetheless have to be swallowed whole. As for initial perceptions, it's difficult to know where to begin. It's perhaps safest to say that New Orleans offered a frontal assault on the senses. Those approaching New Orleans, especially in the warm months, which was most of the time, were likely, if the breeze was just right, to smell the city before they could see it. This was not necessarily unusual for 19th century towns, but the Crescent City was almost certainly something special in this regard. Indeed, one French visitor just before the American transition noted that, quote, nothing equals the filthiness of New Orleans. The city is not paved and probably never will be under the Spaniards. Its markets, which are unventilated, are adorned with fish that rot there for want of purchasers. Its squares are covered with the filth of animals which no one takes the trouble to remove. If such a malodorous introduction failed as a gatekeeping device, an intrepid outsider upon entering the town would be struck by a kaleidoscope of color and a variety of humanity as yet unequaled by any other American city. Another eyewitness on the eve of the Louisiana Purchase offered these observations. I dare say there are a few places in the world, he wrote, where one may see in a locality of like extent the human species so diversified in nations, races, and colors as in New Orleans. It really is an original spectacle, and one that seems to have been reserved for this little corner of the world. Moreover, this veritable showroom of the human race undoubtedly struck the ear as well as the eye. Not only did an uncounted number of languages ricochet from Saul to stall in the same markets that attracted olfactory attention, but their cultural accoutrement, particularly those in song and dance, moved back off the river, penetrating the neighborhoods and squares of the city's interior. Engineer Benjamin Henry Latrobe, arriving in early 1819, wrote in his journal that even then, more than a decade and a half after the American takeover, New Orleans had an odd look and that it presented a visage wholly new even to one who has traveled much in Europe and America. Even more telling, his journal included sketches of African musical instruments that he had seen in Congo Square on a Sunday afternoon after he had followed to its source the low rumbling percussion that emanated from them and hundreds of dancing feet. As for the senses of taste and touch, we can first turn to Latrobe for an account of some of the regional delicacies that were easily available in the public markets, and second, perhaps agree that an extended exploration of the city's sensuality should await another time and venue. If it can be claimed that New Orleans attacked the newcomer's senses, it may also be fairly said that their sensibilities came in for similar treatment. This was nowhere more true than with the man most responsible for its acquisition, the President of the United States, Thomas Jefferson himself. Opponents offended by the arrogation of executive authority needed to complete the Louisiana Purchase assailed and embarrassed Jefferson, the erstwhile strict constructionist, for assuming powers that were nowhere enumerated in the Constitution. Viewing the virtual doubling of the territory of the United States as a power grab as well as a land grab they denounced him as a hypocrite. And if we focus on New Orleans for a moment, we can see that its critics had more reason to complain than they had imagined. New Orleans had to have frightened Jefferson more than it attracted him. In the first instance, he didn't care for cities as a matter of principle. They were the natural homes of vice and corruption, he believed, repositories of the baser human instincts, and identified politically with mob rule, the antithesis of the yeoman farmers republic of his dreams. His distaste for urban life was such that he actually found a silver lining in the yellow fever outbreak that took 4,000 lives and 10 percent of Philadelphia's population between August and October of 1793. 
as he joined other members of the federal government, including George Washington, in flight from the epidemic, he speculated that the disease would beneficially thin out the urban population and discourage the growth of great cities that could only be pestilential to the morals, the health, and the liberties of man. What attraction New Orleans held for Jefferson was largely strategic. His fear of a French reoccupation of Louisiana was so great that he contemplated what was for him the unthinkable, an alliance with the British. There is on the globe one single spot, he wrote, the possessor of which is our natural and habitual enemy. It is New Orleans, through which the produce of three-eighths of our territory must pass to market. The day France takes possession of New Orleans, from that moment we must marry ourselves to the British fleet and nation. It is clear, then, why Jefferson, reservations notwithstanding, jumped at the chance to acquire Louisiana and the Isle of New Orleans when Napoleon decided upon a sale rather than an occupation. But what exactly had he obtained? If discomfited by an urban concentration that ranked seventh in size among the Republic cities in the census year of 1810, with a population of 17,242, he probably would have become queasy to learn that New Orleans' startling rate of growth would make it the largest city in the Deep South and the third greatest in the nation by 1840, with a headcount of 102,193. Overall, in the half century between 1810 and 1860, the city's population grew 10 times its territorial size to nearly 170,000. But size was not all that mattered. New Orleans would remain in the generation that immediately ensued, an alien place poised to absorb the third thin layer of officials sent to rule it in the last 40 years. This time, however, things would be different. Though initially outnumbered by non-English-speaking Roman Catholics, the Anglo-Protestant Americans were there to stay, and their presence would only grow. If their initial hold on the situation seemed tenuous and their control contested, they could grant short-term concessions in the pursuit of long-term goals. This was nowhere more evident than in the realm of race where Jefferson, a member of a revolutionary generation and the slave-owning planter class of Virginia, confronted in New Orleans a racial situation unlike any he had experienced before. Like most other Caribbean slave societies, New Orleans developed a three-tiered, multiracial social structure in which a class of marginal status and frequently mixed origin emerged between blacks and whites. The rest of the United States, with a couple of notable exceptions, was at the same time busy fashioning a more rigid two-tiered structure that drew a single unyielding line between the white and the non-white. New Orleans' middle tier of free people of color first appeared in significant numbers late in the French colonial period, numbering perhaps 100 on the eve of Spanish control. A census taken three years after the purchase, however, counted 2,312, indicating their significant growth over the previous 40 years. Largely attributable to liberalized manumission practices rising from Spanish military, economic, social, and political need, this was the foundation upon which an increasingly self-conscious class swiftly developed. Totaling about one-seventh of the city's population at the time of the American takeover, the free people of color benefited enormously from migration from San Domingue and Cuba, adding another 3,102 individuals in 1809 alone. By the next census year, 1810, slaves and free people of color combined in nearly equal proportions, according to conservative estimates, to represent about two-thirds of the city's populace. And the influx of Americans notwithstanding, French speakers still outnumbered English speakers by three to one in that same year. A largely black, French-speaking Catholic city that included large numbers of free people of color would not be easily understood, let alone absorbed, by its new occupiers. New Orleans was not Richmond, 
It was not even Philadelphia. Americans, of course, had some experience in dealing with free people of color, particularly in eastern seaboard cities. But the situation in New Orleans was complicated, and by more than color, religion, and language. Not only was the free black community unusually large, both proportionately and in absolute numbers, in the antebellum period it would be surpassed only by Baltimore's, but it possessed several unique characteristics. Despite the endemic poverty that afflicted many, New Orleans free people of color possessed a fully articulated class structure that included a property-owning, educated elite along with a skilled stratum of artisans and laborers. They occupied an essential niche in the local economy. And coming out of the Spanish era, they had developed an institutional base that featured an experienced militia with its own articulate leadership. Leadership that could read and understand the terms of the Louisiana Purchase Treaty that granted the full rights of citizenship in the American Republic to those who were free under the French. In short, they believed they had rights and they were armed. If anyone suggests that experience drawn from the nation's other well-known three-tiered slave society, Charleston, offered any guidance in this situation, they are mistaken. South Carolina's urban free people of color were comparatively few, economically marginal, already more Americanized, and far less assertive in claiming the rights of citizenship than their New Orleans counterparts. American dominion over New Orleans would impact race relations in at least two important ways. Aside from a booming plantation economy that generated an insatiable demand for slaves, Louisiana's status as a territory of the United States meant the adoption of new political institutions and procedures on the one hand, and ultimately a flood of migrants from the north and east on the other. The new, more democratic political arrangements actually gave greater voice to Louisiana's emergent planter class and removed whatever protective cover was offered by a paternalistic royal authority. In severing the church-state tie, moreover, the American polity also undermined what Karen Bell has called the liberal Latin European religious attitudes that remained especially among Spanish clerics. The new political conditions would then, over time, lead to the erosion of rights and privileges enjoyed by free people of color. Second, the massive arrival of migrants who had little experience with and less sympathy for New Orleans tripartite Caribbean racial order meant the Anglo-American insistence upon the establishment of an uncompromising racial framework that recognized no distinction beyond that separating black from white. Incorporation into the United States, in short, meant that great pressure would be brought to bear on the very existence of New Orleans' third tier. If a more democratic polity gave freer reign to the slave owners' racial predilections, however, they were not all immediately gratified. There were countervailing influences. Chief among these was the very weakness of the new regime and the insecurity of the territory and its cadre of new administrators. The need to tread lightly and balance or placate conflicting interests prevented the sweeping changes demanded by some. The caution exhibited by the new territorial governor, William C. C. Claiborne, a 28-year-old English-speaking Protestant appointed by his fellow Virginian Thomas Jefferson, is illustrative. The governance of New Orleans, Claiborne wrote shortly after he assumed office, will take much care and prudence to prevent tumult and confusion. He went on, the population was composed of so heterogeneous a mass, such prejudices exist, and there are so many interests to reconcile that I fear no form of government can give general satisfaction. A spirit of dissatisfaction certainly exists, he informs his superior in, superiors in 1804, and he warned that there were those who labored to increase it. Well, what were the problems or interests demanding attention? First and foremost was the question of slavery, and particularly the closing of the African slave trade. Claiborne was unequivocal in his conviction that an anticipated congressional prohibition of the trade generated the highest level of dissatisfaction among white Louisianians, 
and constituted their chief complaint against the new administration. Yet, those who clamored for more slaves were haunted by the specter of the Haitian Revolution and the primal fear of servile insurrection. The governor knew the trade could not be continued without the importation of dangerous characters. His establishment of elaborate screening procedures outside of the city notwithstanding, Claiborne believed that many such individuals slipped by and that unscrupulous slave traders, if you'll pardon a redundancy, would smuggle in many others ahead of the deadline. As for the immigrants, free and slave, then streaming into New Orleans from France, and as he called them, the French West India Islands, Claiborne judged many to be, quote, men of desperate characters and revolutionary dispositions. It would indeed be difficult to strike upon any policy that would bring general satisfaction to those seeking both slaves and security. There were other sources of dangers as well. The territorial government believed that Spain and France continued to intrigue in the area, and Spanish troops, along with their military stores, maintained a visible presence in New Orleans well after the American takeover. The former Spanish governor, Casa Calvo, and other colonial civil and military officials still resident in the area soon became troublesome to Claiborne and engaged in the incitement, he believed, of both Indians and slaves. The English remained an external threat, as did presumably some Americans in the famous Burr conspiracy in the years between 1805 and 1807. And then there were the free people of color and their experienced trained militia. Threatened from seemingly every quarter, how could the new regime command the loyalty of New Orleans' heterogeneous mass? If Claiborne assigned top priority to winning the allegiance, or at least not alienating local whites, whether native or migrant, he did not have to be psychic to understand their agenda. Beyond their immediate protest over a pending ban on the African slave trade, locals proposed and continued to pursue throughout the antebellum period a host of administrative and legislative measures that had the collective intent and effect of reducing New Orleans' tripartite racial order to the more familiar dualism. Though not immediately or completely successful, it became apparent within a few short years of the American takeover that pressure, legal and otherwise, would be brought to bear that would first restrict the size and growth of the free colored population, second, isolate that group from both whites and slaves, but particularly raise barriers between them and the former, and third, gradually strip what remained of the free colored population of whatever rights and status it possessed to facilitate its suppression and ultimate disappearance or reduction back into slavery. Having increased some 400% to a total of nearly 8,000 between the 1803 purchase and the census year of 1810, the free people of color represented about one quarter of the entire city's population by the later date. Armed, organized, economically secure, and assertive, they stirred as living refutations of slavery's emergent though not yet fully articulated racial rationale. They also guaranteed that the Americanization of New Orleans racial order would be contested, halting and far from complete, even after slavery's demise. After Congress backed away from an early end to the slave trade, the existence of the free colored militia quickly emerged as a most contentious issue. An institutional bulwark of that community it carried great symbolic weight in addition to its practical importance and provided New Orleans' third tier a public voice. Just one week after he assumed office, Claiborne received a request to incorporate two large companies of people of color into the territory's military forces. Shortly thereafter, barred from white political gatherings, group leaders presented a petition that demanded the full rights as citizens promised in Article Three of the Treaty of Session to the free inhabitants of Louisiana. Incensed local whites demanded immediate retribution for such impertinence, and Claiborne, in fact, issued a barely veiled threat of violence in getting the free men of color to withdraw their memorial. Significantly, however, the governor did not pursue the identity of the petition's author, as whites had demanded. 
and citing the heavy concentration of blacks in the local population, expressed a desire to keep the affair as quiet as possible. I remembered the events that spread blood and desolation in Saint-Domingue, he wrote James Madison, originated in a dispute between the white and mulatto inhabitants, and that the too rigid treatment of the former induced the latter to seek the support and assistance of the Negroes. Territorial legislators remained unswayed, though, and refused to include the Free Colored Battalion in the Militia Acts passed each year from 1804 through 1807. Ultimately, Claiborne recognized the organization of the Free Colored Units on his own, even as he placed them under the command of two white officers and reduced their size. Such a compromise expressed the governor's ambivalence regarding these troops, but once convinced of their loyalty, he became a strong supporter and saw their usefulness. He employed them in suppressing the slave uprising of 1811, noting that they acted, quote, with great exactitude and propriety, end quote. And with the threat of the British looming in the War of 1812, even the legislature turned to them, passing an act that sanctioned the raising of four such companies that eventually responded to Andrew Jackson's patriotic appeals in the Battle of New Orleans. Their performance and service kept the black militia alive until 1834, when the legislature again disbanded it in the midst of growing sectional and abolitionist-inspired tension. Service in defense of the realm did more than by another 20 years or so for the militia. It also, for a time, slowed the momentum of the movement to reduce free black rights and privileges. Indeed, one could see territorial lawmakers beginning to work in earnest both to contain and subjugate the free black community from the earliest opportunity. A rash of measures subsequently emerged in 1806 and 1807 that fully expressed the desire to do away with New Orleans' third tier. The first problem to be addressed involved not merely the striking size of the free black population, but its continuing rapid growth. Relatively high rates of manumission, including the right of self-purchase, a practice instituted under the Spanish known as coartacion, permitted its exercise even against the slave owner's wishes, meant that the city's free black population probably continued to multiply at a pace beyond that of virtually every other southern city. Self-purchases peaked, in fact, around the time of the American takeover, that is between 1800 and 1806, at about 50 per year. The legislature moved quickly to choke off that source of growth. By 1807, it had abolished the practice of coartacion, and adopting the Anglo-American emphasis on individual property rights in its revised slave code, the legislature declared that no owner could be compelled to free a slave except through an act of the legislature itself. The right of guaranteed self-purchase was gone. But they did not stop there. Additional measures spewed forth that laid out special requirements upon those who would be free. No slave younger than 30 years of age, for example, could now be released from service. And belabored the process with a host of burdensome details, such as the need to file a letter of intent under deadline and to notify creditors to present any claims they might have on the owner before any manumission could be completed. The law even permitted re-enslavement to satisfy debts years after freedom had already been granted. Any unauthorized manumissions would be subject to stiff fines. The next most obvious source of free black population growth in the Louisiana territories was in migration from other states and colonies. The legislature moved to squelch this as well. A new 1807 law simply prohibited the entry of free people of color into the state and carried a substantial fine for transgressors. Indigent violators could have found themselves temporarily re-enslaved until the fine was worked off. The massive, exceptional movement of Haitians during this time, the 1809 migration, occurred only after a congressional exemption overrode local wishes. Complementing manumission and migration as a source of free black population growth was, of course, natural increase. Here, territorial authorities simply banned marriage between free people of color and slaves, 
just as it had inherited similar prescriptions affecting blacks and whites from earlier colonial regimes. Children born in wedlock represented, of course, only part of the problem. And to control the rest meant regulating the behavior of whites as well as, perhaps even more than, that of blacks and those of mixed origin. To that end, a series of measures intended to isolate and socially circumscribe the free people of color raised legal barriers that separated the two non-white tiers from each other as well as from whites. Collectively, they tried to render impermeable social membranes that had previously been somewhat porous and sieve-like. The territorial legislature took a key step when it adopted in 1808 the civil code that required notaries and others acting in an official capacity to clearly record on all documents the designation of FMC for free men of color and FWC for free women of color. This had the effect of making it exceedingly difficult for any individual of mixed origin to pass for white. It also marked the abandonment of what had been a familiar, if not customary, practice in many New World Creole societies. Many such societies had defined as white those of one-eighth or less, quote, Negro blood or ancestry. Less liberally, they also regarded as white the great-great-grandchild of an African who had only white ancestry for three generations. Not only did the new racial labeling of official records dispatch the means by which free blacks documented their lineage through three generations, but it facilitated the de facto adoption of the one-drop rule that declared that any African ancestry, no matter how remote, forever marked one as non-white. The creation of broad legal designations such as free man or free woman of color, according to historian Thomas Ingersoll, created an undifferentiated, degraded, free black subclass that could be policed to prevent any intermarriage with whites. Louisiana courts in 1810 further reinforced the color line by declaring that those of mixed racial origins would be presumed free until proven otherwise that the state held literally thousands of exceptions to this presumptive rule, including both fair-skinned slaves and dark-hued free people of color, indicates perhaps the degree to which ideology overran reality. And if the free people of color as a class found themselves further distinguished from slaves by the linkage of color and status, they also soon learned how tenuous that status was. Very quickly, they were stripped of rights enjoyed by free whites and found themselves suffering legal indignities of the sort, often meted out to slaves. Such a confused state of affairs combined with the assertiveness of elements of the free black class to provoke the territory's lawmakers into spelling out racial etiquette in legalistic detail. Free people of color ought never insult or strike white people nor presume themselves equal to whites, the legislators affirmed. On the contrary, they concluded, they ought to yield to them on every occasion and never speak or answer them but with respect. Finally, if the cumulative weight of such measures still did not affect the desired degree of social isolation of New Orleans' third tier, there were more direct means of controlling the sort of interracial contacts that naturally enlarged the free black population. The antebellum period consequently witnessed the restriction of access to public accommodations such as the theater or omnibus lines. Even more pointedly, however, by 1828, the city's notorious quadroon balls fell under legislative scrutiny. In that year, the city government succumbed to public pressure and prohibited white men from attending dressed or masked balls composed of men and women of color. Finally, if the cumulative weight of such measures still did not affect the desired degree of social isolation of New Orleans' third tier, there were more direct means of controlling the sort of interracial contacts that naturally enlarged the free black population. The antebellum period consequently witnessed the restriction of access to public accommodations such as the theater or omnibus lines. Even more pointedly, however, by 1828, the city's notorious quadroon balls 
fell under legislative scrutiny. In that year, the city government succumbed to public pressure and prohibited white men from attending, quote, dressed or masked balls composed of men and women of color, end quote. Such legalistic efforts to control the growth of New Orleans' free black population showed few signs of immediate success. That community represented more than a quarter of the city's populace, as late as 1830, and peaked in absolute numbers in 1840, when more than 15,000 free people of color still counted for about 18% of New Orleans total. By the latter year, they were clearly no longer dependent on manumission or plissage arrangements and miscegenation for their survival. Large enough and endogamous enough, the city's third tier began to sustain itself through its own natural increase. Despite blunting the initial wave of legislated repression, however, New Orleans' free people of color would not fare as well in the 1840s and 1850s. A second, far more devastating onslaught did much to marginalize them, leaving them to confront the Civil War and Reconstruction in a reduced condition. Indeed, by 1850, their population had dropped precipitously to 9,905, and they constituted no more than 8.5% of the city's total. And while they seemingly recovered some lost ground before 1860, the population rose by just over 1,000 to 10,939 before the next census. They continued to slip as a proportion of the whole, amounting to barely 6% of the city's 168,000 people on the eve of the Civil War. It quickly became clear that in the generation preceding the outbreak of hostilities between the North and the South, the third tier buckled under a tandem of forces that hid in rapid succession and coalesced to subvert whatever leverage those of mixed racial origin had previously enjoyed. The first came in the form of an inundating wave of European immigrants, particularly from Ireland and Germany, that knocked New Orleans on its demographic ear, where the United States Commissioners W.C.C. Claiborne and General James Wilkinson took possession of a city in 1803 that was more than two-thirds black. By the time Fort Sumter took its first shell, it was more than 80% white. Most important, and immediately apparent, the free people of color found themselves virtually stripped of their economic niche and in a brutal head-to-head -head competition with white rivals who quickly learned to exploit the second force, race, to tilt the system in their direction. Not only were free blacks no longer economically essential to the well-being of the larger metropolis, they were dangerous liabilities as far as immigrant workers were concerned. The rise of abolitionism, the growth in sectional tensions, and the gut-wrenching fear of slave insurrection, whether real or imagined, further conspired to strip the free-colored community of its second earlier advantage as well. Viewed before as an element of security, and as defenders of the regime, local whites could only view them now with suspicion and as potential sources of social chaos and disorder. As the hammer of repression came down upon them, thousands fled to France, Haiti, Cuba, Mexico, and other locales, and uncounted others passed into the larger white population when opportunity and inclination came together. That the hammer came down, there can be no doubt. Manumission became more difficult in the 1850s, and the law now demanded that freed service leave the state or post a $1,000 bond. In 1857, perhaps tired of nibbling around the edges of the problem, the state legislature simply banned manumission outright. Similarly, lawmakers tightened up the racial order by demanding that free black sailors passing through the port register with authorities and, if staying more than a couple of days, lodge themselves in the parish jail. The exclusion of free people of color from other states was also reinforced, and in 1859 a new law offered free blacks their choice of masters if only they would consent to re-enslavement. Things would get worse. 
The state also refused now to incorporate any new institutions or organizations rooted in the free black community. Finally, a new host of regulatory ordinances passed by the city restricted a wide range of recreational and commercial activity. It became illegal for free individuals of mixed race, for example, to keep coffee houses, billiard tables, or retail stores where liquor was sold. Nor could they legally play cards, dominoes, or attend certain social gatherings with slaves. Undertaken in the name of security, as were added restrictions on the right of assembly and travel, such measures also seemed designed with economic purposes in mind. Whatever the motivation, however, it seems apparent that the life was being squeezed out of the free black community. One free person of color, Rudolph de Dune, labeled this broad legislative assault a new despotism that left his people not far removed from the status of slavery. Most telling was the heightened sense of physical vulnerability. Any free black man who possessed wealth in the respect of his peers, de Dune recalled, was the sure target of arrest, ill treatment, and imprisonment according to the caprice of the most depraved police officers or of denunciation by the most despicable residents of the city. Violence became more manifest and common each day, he wrote, of the 1850s. Enforcement of the restrictive laws and ordinances remained problematic, but ultimately beside the point. The object was not to effect a perfect separation of New Orleans racial components, but to draw a line in the sand and intimidate while facilitating the internalization of the new racial order. The laws expressed ideals to be striven for, not any achievable reality. They held up a vision of a society sharply and cleanly divided between white and black and had little tolerance for racial ambiguity or ambivalence. History rarely invokes such tidy transitions, however, and the change from a three-tiered Caribbean racial order to an Americanized racial dualism that recognized no intermediate status between black and white in New Orleans would remain contested and incomplete. The curious coexistence of the two systems would be captured by Louisiana Supreme Court in 1856. With just a touch of hyperbole, the court reaffirmed in that year that, quote, in the eye of the Louisiana law, there is all the difference between a free man of color and a slave that there is between a white man and a slave, end quote. Perhaps anticipating next year's Dred Scott decision, or more precisely, the struggles to come in Reconstruction and the Jim Crow era, an obstreperous dissenter on the court countered with the assertion that free people of color and slaves comprised, quote, a single homogeneous class of beings distinguished from all others by nature, custom, and law, and never confounded with citizens of the state. No white person can be a slave, no colored person can be a citizen. The court's majority invoked precedent and spoke for the past. The future, however, belonged to the voice of protest. Taking the long view, Alexis de Tocqueville, as he so often did, cut to the core of the dilemma facing white New Orleanians. After viewing the refined accomplishments of the city's free black elite, he asked a group of socially prominent white civic leaders if they planned to grant equality to such educated and sophisticated neighbors. Recoiling in horror, the whites denied the possibility. Apparently assessing the situation in light of the Haitian Revolution, as had Claiborne a generation before, Tocqueville warned of the racial dynamic they would subsequently set loose. Adopting a two-tier system with a one-drop rule only added up to trouble according to his calculations. I much fear, he admonished his listeners in reference to the suppressed third tier, that they will one day make themselves your ministers. If nearly a century and a half passed before it came to fruition, it remained a prophecy that included more than a little insight.